OK, the recording started. Thank you very much, Heidi. Cheers. Thank you. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. For those of you who are the extra students, hopefully you're not too sick of hearing from me. Uh, there's been a lot of that this week, but I hope you found it interesting so far. Uh, that was a great talk we've just had from Sarah Edwards, which has hopefully put you in an interactive mind. And, and this second talk this morning, uh, I think it's important generally going forwards with your careers, but also in advance of you going off to clinical environments uh, tomorrow or Friday. Uh, for those who haven't uh, met me or heard me talk before, uh, my name is Dr Con. I'm a child psychiatrist working in Exeter and I work in liaison psychiatry, which is the interface between physical and mental health. So I spend a lot of time on the paediatric ward and I'm the lead psychiatrist uh, for for eating disorders when it relates to hospital care. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if that's such a thing you do, at Rory Con, and I, I tweet just about mental health really, not about cats. So um, why are we going to talk about eating disorders? Because it's very important. What do I want to say in advance? I want to give you a health warning, I suppose, that um, as with all of this week in psychiatry, it is uh, it, these are emotive subjects to talk about and and mm -hmm. I'm well aware that in any given cohort of medical students there will be a number of people who've either recovered from eating disorders uh, from their adolescence or may well be struggling with an eating mm -hmm. disorder and um, I wanted to put that out there to say if this is going to be a mm -hmm. triggering talk for you then uh, by all means tune out if you don't want to listen to it right now uh, but also, if you are struggling with your eating, there are lots of um, ways of gaining support. Uh, so don't suffer in silence. And a common question people ask is, what should I do if I'm worried about um, a flatmate? Well, that's difficult. But I just encourage you all to have conversations with one another and, and raise your concerns gently and see if you can be supportive. I want to ask you um, what it is you want to know about eating disorders. So I'd encourage you to use the chat box and perhaps every few minutes I'll refer back to that and uh, and see what I can pick up from your questions. But what I want to do in this talk is uh, shed some light on eating disorders. Those of you from Exeter had some small group work yesterday looking at a case of anorexia, but I want to give more detail on that uh, to talk about the, the origins of eating disorders as we, as we understand them particularly what the CAMs do to manage them, and lots of management of eating disorders is in the under 18s. And then think about what the role is of someone like me as a psychiatrist, but also of a GP and a paediatrician. And uh, within this audience, uh, lots of you will go on to fulfill one of those uh, groups. So this is the place we're starting from, is a recognition that medical schools have traditionally done very poorly in giving any education about eating disorders. Um, this is from a paper a couple of years ago, and the total number of hours spent on eating disorder teaching in medical schools is less than two. So if we look at yesterday and today, hopefully we're making at least two hours, but please find space at other points in your curriculum to, to ask questions of people about eating disorders and make sure you do some reading about this uh, complex area. So the conclusion this paper comes to is that actually this increases the risk of eating disorders to young people and adults because doctors um, of the future aren't sufficiently prepared. And I mentioned parity of esteem earlier this week. Well, this is the same thing, really. Uh, we have a drive now of parity of esteem to bring together body and mind. And this talk is about that as well as about thinking of physical and mental health and how those two things cannot be separated as it's been done in this slide. And learning more about eating disorders uh, can help you to be better doctors and to save many lives. So some of the most satisfying parts of the work that I do is in thinking about the cases of eating disorders, which I've the young people who have I've helped uh, recover. And if they hadn't have had input from from my team in CAMS, they would have almost certainly gone on to uh, suffer from an intractable, uh, possibly lifelong uh, severe mental illness. So. This is one of those areas in psychiatry where you can be sure that you are saving lives and don't let anyone tell you that psychiatrists don't save lives. There's also a context to this. These slides now uh, maybe a couple of years old, but they still hold true that we do have problems in psychiatry with our waiting lists and also with facilities to manage young people. So sadly, uh, both children and adults are often 
uh, sent a long way away from their, their homes to have treatment for things such as eating disorders. And it's it's just worth saying that I, I hope this landscape changes. But currently, if I want to admit a young person to a specialist eating disorder unit, it'll often be um, 100 or more miles away from their home. And that clearly isn't beneficial for their recovery. So we've still got quite a long way to go, but we've made some really good progress. So the NHS now has access and waiting time standards. Uh, and what this means is if a GP refers a young person who potentially has an eating disorder to paediatrics and CAMS, they will have to have had an assessment within two weeks of that referral. And that is quite different from uh, many other aspects of uh, physical health. And the average paediatrician wouldn't see a normal referral uh, to community paediatrics in that time frame, and nor would we in CAMS. So there's a recognition that these are uh, disorders where early intervention is absolutely critical. So these are now national standards which we need to uh, perform against and that's good. I often use this slide when I'm talking to paediatric staff, uh, in particular nurses on the paediatric ward, and I say that one thing that's really challenging about looking after um, people with eating disorders is that we're accustomed in medicine to uh, having a collaborative relationship with our patients, agreeing a treatment plan and frankly mm -hmm. them being grateful for our help and them seeking support appropriately. And one of the really challenging parts about eating disorders, of course, is that the, the young person in, in front of us in, in my clinic may well say that they don't want treatment because they may well consider themselves not to be ill. Their insight may be very limited. And this can feel like having a battle with a patient, quite frankly. Uh, so it is emotive for that reason. And on the bottom here is a young person who appears to have an NG tube coming out of their nose uh, and is maybe receiving also some oral medication. And that looks collaborative and, and fine. But in extreme examples, and this is unusual, but in extreme examples, we do end up uh, restraining some patients to NG feed them to save their lives. So. You probably won't see that on your clinical placements this week, but just to, to give you a sense of, of, of how bad things can get. So what are eating disorders? Well, that's a very broad church. It's a, you know, a, a spectrum, really. Uh, a range of mental health disorders which are potentially life threatening, secondary to the physical effects. And in addition, there is a rate of suicide within people who struggle with eating disorders. And they are also disorders where there are multiple comorbidities, um, in particular things like depression, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, ASC being autistic spectrum condition, CSA, childhood sexual abuse, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, social concerns, um, it goes on and on. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's probably less likely that I meet a patient who has just a typical sort of straightforward anorexia nervosa without any of these other complicating factors, which may indeed have the eating disorder. The average of age, age of onset is, is 14, so early to mid adolescence. And that's why as a child psychiatrist, obviously I'm particularly concerned and interested in this area. We are seeing uh, increasing numbers of young people presenting in this manner uh, and increasing numbers in younger age groups. And of course, there are lots of theories about this. You may have theories of your own, lots of implication of social media with um, apps such as Instagram, which encourage uh, comparative association of young people. And I think the jury's out. So social media isn't as risky as it is portrayed perhaps in the media, in my view, but clearly for eating disorders, this is very problematic. And there are lots of forums out there. Some of you may have accessed them yourselves with tips and tricks about how to lose weight rapidly and also how to um, maybe get around the medical model uh, in order to uh, avoid being treated. Girls are much more commonly affected by eating disorders than boys. Again, lots of uh, hypotheses about that and there are differences in their presentation so in an average year in the clinic in Exeter in CAMS we'll see about 100 referrals of young people with eating disorders I would say 90 to 95 of those will be girls and the boys that come will be slightly less typical in their presentation uh, there might be references to things like uh, bigorexia so boys want you to have a certain uh, 
body appearance, which isn't necessarily about being slim. It might be about being very muscular, but that can also be dangerous in its own way with use of things like protein shakes and excessive exercise. So it's really important to say that not all eating problems, difficulties are or will become eating disorders. So it's extremely common in uh, young people as part of their uh, adolescent development, particularly to go through phases with their eating. Uh, young children ha are, are prone to lots of uh, fussiness and, and fatty eatings and sensory difficulties in particular with young people, for example, with autism might come to the fore and the classic description from a family member might be, oh, they'll only eat things that are brown or crunchy. So they eat crisps and chips, uh, but they will avoid anything that is um, a, a certain texture. So it might be that, that sensory needs are what we're seeing really as opposed to disordered eating. Um, we also need to take into account uh, physical illnesses which may be affecting eating patterns. Um, uh, diabetes is an obvious one and celiac disease. So it is normal to uh, find young people restricting eating in certain ways. And sometimes that's because of medical advice that they are following. It's also normal for, for kids to go through perhaps phases of uh, restricting their eating. And sometimes that's uh, because they're trying to follow what their peers are doing. It might be based on their philosophical ideas, for example, veganism, or it might be, frankly, to uh, irritate parents, for example. This is about testing out boundaries. Uh, but we also need to think that eating problems can be a sign of neglect. Uh, they also relate to things like uh, poverty. If simply a family does not have enough to eat, which might masquerade as, a, as an eating problem. Um, and kids in particular can struggle uh, with their appetite secondary to medication. So there might be iatrogenic reasons why young people are eating much less. And a classic example would be stimulant medications for ADHD, which suppress appetite. That's one reason why uh, people with eating disorders might drink lots of caffeine, tea and coffee, because uh, caffeine is a stimulant and that suppresses appetite as well as filling up the stomach with liquid. There are a broad range of eating disorders, as I said, we're going to focus on anorexia nervosa, but uh, I want us to think about what atypical anorexia might look like, which might be that not all of the classic criteria for anorexia, which we're going to talk about, are fulfilled. And it might be that the young person is restricting their eating uh, for a different reason, either secondary to uh, depressive illness or secondary to emotional instability. And this can be a form of expression around uh, distress primarily rather than uh, the classic cognitive associations of anorexia. Uh, bulimia nervosa uh, is characterized by uh, binging and purging in the absence of a BMI that is sufficiently low enough to be anorexic. So anorexia nervosa has two principal subtypes, the restrictive sub subtype and a, a binge purge subtype. That's the key thing to think about in, in bulimia. So in anorexia, there can be purging and there can also be excessive eating at times, uh, but bulimia, the BMI is higher, in fact, in normal or uh, high range. Binge eating disorder is sometimes seen uh, as its own uh, criteria if there isn't purging and the BMI is normal. EDNOS refers to that catch-all term of eating disorder not otherwise specified and it's unlikely you would see that uh, written down but that's a kind of term that might describe actually there's an eating problem here and it doesn't really fit into any of these particular criteria. There are also in younger kids unusual eating presentations. You may have heard of something called PICA, P-I-C-A, which is when kids eat unusual foods like putting coal into their mouth, where they might be nutritionally deficient and trying to sustain themselves through nutrition from a non-food. Uh, there's also ARFID, which is sometimes referred to uh, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. And that's more likely to be the uh, young child with an autistic spectrum condition who is only having very specific foods and restricting lots of other things. They'll only eat ice cream and, uh, and chips, for example. So they're not getting enough nutrition, but equally they're, they're not restricting their food because they're concerned about calories. Diabulimia isn't a diagnosis in its own right, neither is bigorexia, but diabulimia is a very concerning condition in which a young person who has type 1 diabetes uh, 
<clears throat> may be combined with a wish to lose weight. Um, that is a really toxic combination and very dangerous. So what is anorexia nervosa? The first thing to say, it's not simply a westernised uh, syndrome. And there was a, a while for which that was believed to be the case. This was something about uh, affluence and uh, middle class kids who could um, uh, afford to do this sort of thing, I suppose. But actually, we see anorexia present uh, internationally, worldwide. Yes, in, in lower rates, uh, of course, in countries where uh, there may be more poverty and uh, indeed starvation. But this is not a Western bound syndrome. There's a very strong genetic component. And an important part of taking a history is to find out who else in the family might have an unusual relationship with food. There are lots of theories about why anorexia arises. And the first is to say, well, if you're genetically predisposed to developing this problem, then that is that is the main risk factor, to be honest. But people have written about the sort of psychodynamic reasons this might happen. And a classic one is describing a response to feeling out of control. And actually, lots of young people I will meet will say something exactly along those lines, like my intake is the only thing that I feel in control of. And that's been particularly uh, prevalent during COVID because our referral rates to CAMS have dropped in the last six months, but our referrals of eating disorders or disordered eating have uh, risen exponentially. And whilst everything out there has felt kind of out of control and threatening, some young people have responded to that uh, by really com controlling their, their intake. There are also some theories more psychoanalytic about avoiding the challenges of adolescence. So some, some young people with severe eating disorders essentially get frozen in the, uh, in the adolescent state, uh, either pre-puberty or, or mid-puberty. And, uh, you know, growing up is a, is a frightening thing. So uh, some young girls, and we're principally talking about girls here, will present with stalled uh, development of sexual, secondary sexual characteristics. And that's something for us to think about. Outcomes uh, have a, a broad range. They're better than they used to be, certainly. About 30 or 40 percent go on to have a normal relationship with food and are completely uh, recovered from their anorexia. Uh, about a third will have ongoing difficulties with food, which will be lifelong and they may ins be insightful enough to recognise that. Um, but about 30% have, have a poor outcome and this has got the highest mortality rate of all the psychiatric illnesses. So it is a, a big concern and about 20% of people will die from anorexia. So. This is a key slide in terms of your takeaway messages and what comes up in exams and also what clinically you need to be asking about. OK, so these are the key uh, components to meet this diagnosis. A fear of fatness, which the patient may not uh, let on to you immediately, but uh, gently asking about you will tend to find this. So a, a principal concern about worrying if I eat, I will become fat, even if they're grossly underweight. And with that, a body image distortion. So the young person who is already underweight and looks at themselves and says, look at me, I'm fat. I'm, just, I'm staring at my thighs, my tummy, the shape of my face. Uh, so they have uh, body dysmorphic ideas. Restriction of calorific intake clearly needs to be part of our of our criteria. <clears throat> and if that's not going on, we need to question, well, how else is this weight loss happening? And might there be a physical reason causing it? And an abnormally low BMI, uh, principally thought to be less than 15% below their uh, expected weight for height in young people. Additionally, there are lots of other components, but these aren't uh, required for the diagnostic criteria. So some young people and adults will exercise excessively. Uh, they may use certain medications which uh, aid in inverted commas, weight loss, like uh, laxatives and diuretics, stimulants, those come with their own high risks as well. So we do see young people uh, chronically dehydrated because of uh, essentially diarrhea and uh, polyuria. And purging also can be dangerous because of course it affects our electrolytes. So uh, a low potassium is commonly seen in the outpatient clinic and that will lead us on to questions particularly around what purging is going on. And endocrine dysfunction is 
part of the diagnostic criteria. Uh, the problem with talking about amenorrhea, though, as a diagnostic necessity is that if I see an 11 year old in clinic who hasn't started her periods, uh, I can't rely on the fact that she needs to have stopped her periods to meet criteria. And the same in recognising that boys can have anorexia, well, amenorrhea therefore uh, doesn't work as a diagnostic criteria, but we might measure a boy's uh, endocrine function. And about a year ago, I had a young lad who was very focused on being uh, as sort of manly as he, he could be in his appearance with, with lots of muscles and so on. Uh, it was helpful to measure his testosterone and find out that his level was zero. That led on to a conversation about the fact he had lost his sex drive. That helped him start to eat and be interested in girls again. And so it was actually that measurement that was really uh, helpful in his recovery. Screening tools. So you may have come across SCOF because I was taught this at medical school. Uh, it's quite a helpful mnemonic, but it's not validated. So uh, if you think about this in the exam context, that's helpful. If you've got an OSCE where you're screening for an eating disorder, then by all means use this in your head, but recognise that uh, it's not technically validated. So a score of any of these doesn't really mean very much. But SCOF stands for whether they make themselves sick because of feeling uncomfortably full, whether they worry they've lost control about their eating, have they recently lost more than one stone in a three month period? So that bit's quite specific, isn't it? <clears throat> a belief about being fat. And uh, would the person say that food dominates your life? So a score of two notionally indicates a likely case of eating disorder. You might want to have this in your mind for your OSCEs. There is a tool we'll occasionally use called the Eat26, but you don't really need to know about that. If you're particularly interested, you can Google it and find out what the questions are involved. This is the very medical bit of the talk, I suppose. So uh, when we get a new referral of a young person or an adult who's restricting their intake, uh, the primary thing we need to think about is their, is their physical risk. So how bad is their, is their risk? Now, because of homeostasis and our body being as clever and adaptable as it is, often we'll meet a, a young person who is really significantly physically ill, who've lost an awful lot of weight, but when we do their baseline blood tests, we find that they are normal. And a com common conversation for me to have in clinic with a young person, uh, once they've had the blood test, is they say, well, I'm not unwell because look, my blood tests are normal, so you're lying to me. I'm obviously fine. And I actually show them this slide and I show them this graphic of uh, what looks like all, all men in a boat, which could be about to sink, but for the fact that all the water is being chucked out of it constantly. And it's a really helpful analogy because a bright enough child with persuasion can understand that their body is doing this bailing out of water constantly. And the moment those people inside the boat or those organs get too tired, that boat sinks instantly. So I say, actually, I don't really, I, I mean, I, I do care if your blood tests are abnormal. And actually that is a sign that really uh, we are at uh, end stage uh, of physical compromise. That can be very concerning. I talked to them all about uh, also about the effects on the body in the longer term. So here is a DEXA scan of the spine. And what we'll find in longer term weight loss is that uh, young people are, can develop osteoporosis, which is not something that you want clearly, but they may not realise that that's a possibility. Even more concerning, and if I'm trying to raise the anxiety in the young person about the severeness of what's going on, which they might be lacking insight, I talk about the effect on the rest of their body. So when we lose fat from the visible parts of our body, our thighs, our stomach, uh, we actually also losing fat around our vital organs. So at the top here on the left, we have a normal chest x-ray of a heart and a CT scan next to it. Uh, and under, underneath, this is a chest x-ray of a, a wasted heart that has lost the fat content around it. So it's an abnormal shape and the CT scan next to it. And here also the difference in brain structure between a healthy adult and an adult who has chronic anorexia nervosa. And you can see actually the brain appears shrunk because there is a loss of fat necessary around the brain to perform normal function. And I have had examples in clinic where suddenly the young person and the family have looked really like they're having a light bulb moment. Um, although, you know, who would have thought you'd pull up PowerPoint slides to help a young patient uh, improve their insight. 
So I want to, to bust some myths really about the origin of anorexia. It used to be thought that schizophrenia was produced by schizophrenogenic families. Uh, and it also used to be thought that autism uh, arose from what were termed refrigerator mothers, i.e. parenting that was so cold that a child developed with no emotional connection with the world. Those have been debunked. We're still debunking the idea that there is such a thing as a, as a, a family that can produce anorexia. So whilst genetic predisposition is very strong and behaviours around eating in a family can be predisposing, there's no evidence that supports the idea that parenting styles make anorexia. And as a result, it isn't a requirement to separate the child from the family to treat anorexia. In fact, we spend a lot of time in camps <coughs> working with parents and families as part of the treating team. It is worth saying, though, that families can be made to appear dysfunctional as a product of what goes on with the eating disorder. So these are really cruel, cruel illnesses. And I look after young people who might every mealtime be smashing plates and screaming at parents and uh, running away from home. And this inevitably leads to great ruptures in family systems. And by the time they come to meet me as a psychiatrist, they might really appear quite disturbed. But pre-morbidly, before the start of the anorexia, uh, things might have been OK. So we need to be mindful of what we're seeing in the clinical room in front of us. Why is it particularly difficult treating eating disorders in, in, in young people? Because this is highly emotive work and, and frankly a parent's worst nightmare. Uh, eating disorders are stigmatised and misunderstood and the public perception might be uh, of a parent in the playground by the other parents, well this must be their fault that their child's not eating. Additionally, we all carry our own baggage and beliefs. So. Uh, lots of people, including those working in the eating disorders field, as, as much as a third in some studies, uh, have unusual relationships with food. Uh, lots of lots of dietitians, for example, uh, have um, a background of, of eating disorders, and that's quite well known. Uh, but this can stimulate our own thoughts and worries about food working in this field. It's tricky with children and young people because of the legal frameworks involved. That's for another talk, really. Um, and also, I've said the nature of the illness means that we don't have people in front of us who are necessarily uh, all that keen on getting help, or so it seems. So is this a worsening problem? Yes, I've said that the numbers of referrals we're getting are going up, and I well imagine we are about to get an onslaught now that school are going back of kids who spent the last six months at home, perhaps gradually losing weight, not really being attended to by their parents or uh, things being ignored, frankly. And there are going to be schools that pick up kids who have plummeted in weight over the summer. And the rates of admissions for eating disorders to paediatric wards has gone up uh, significantly by about 20%. Comorbidities I've mentioned are, are really uh, very common. And this is the disentangling work of the child psychiatrist particularly, is to work out, well, how much of this presentation might actually be obsessive compulsive behaviour around food as opposed to primarily uh, anorexia. And if you can see at the heart of this Venn diagram here, there are certain uh, predisposing factors uh, that can make all of these uh, components more likely. So perfectionistic traits, a tendency to be cognitively rigid, that is black and white thinking, I either eat or I don't eat, for example. Uh, traits of anxiety, uh, difficulties with with working memory and uh, and also an inability to see the sort of bigger picture. So people who are very focused on detail, they can't see the wood for the trees type people are being more likely to develop these uh, very specific beliefs about food and therefore they will overvalue the content of the calories of a piece of chocolate in front of them versus the context of the fact that gosh they're in hospital and actually if they ate more they'd be able to be discharged. So uh, the sort of delusional concept uh, comes in when people get very, very fixated on certain ideas. And that leads us on to thinking about autism and eating disorder uh, very commonly uh, coexisting. And actually, we, we miss autism a lot, particularly in adolescent girls. And sometimes the first presentation really of autism or the first time someone's thought about autism in a teenage girl is when they present with eating problems. 
Uh, but we will see sensory sensitivities and also something called food jagging, which is a classic description of a young child who will eat just fish fingers, perhaps for a month, and then stop that completely and only want macaroni and cheese. And they'll do that for two weeks and then they'll only eat jacket potato. And that's called food jagging, a sort of a moving between one thing and another, which is quite classic in autism in young children. Uh, the I don't need to eat uh, school of, of beliefs, which just seems very shut off and concrete. So what are the warning signs that we need to be looking out for as, as parents or as, as GPs in particular um, and schools as well? So calorie counting, of course, young people who seem anxious at mealtimes, they might be restless, they might be avoiding coming downstairs a lot of the time. Food that goes uneaten starts off as bits being scraped uh, into the bin and then food separated out on the plate. Uh, taking much longer to eat meals uh, than others without necessarily appearing distressed around it and wanting to eat alone uh, is important. I meet quite a lot of young people who've managed to lose weight without their parents realising because they've ended up storing food in their in their room, they've sort of pouched it perhaps in their at the back of their mouths or hidden it in clothes, uh, in bras for example, uh, that happens quite a lot. And another warning sign would be a young person drinking a lot because they might be feeling hungry fundamentally and filling up their, their tummy with fluid to fight that feeling of hunger, uh, but they are not, they're not eating. An obsessive interest in food, so classically the young person who's stopped eating, but they're baking lots of cakes for the rest of the family, they're watching lots of food shows, uh, they're going on the Ocado website, a lot of the time and they seem to know all the calorie content of everything that's in the fridge. Uh, these are clearly very significant warning signs. Also we'll ask family if they've noticed anything unusual such as uh, the young person going to the toilet immediately after meals which might suggest they're purging. Exercise in secret happens and when we probe with parents we sometimes hear oh yeah well actually there has been quite a lot of noise going on up in their room after meals and actually it turns out they've been doing 200 star jumps immediately after eating. Um, Fitbits are an absolute bane to be honest. Uh, no child should be monitoring their their steps that they're doing, I feel, uh, unless they're, they're under maybe an obesity service and they're being encouraged to do so. But this can quickly uh, shift into very worrying behaviour uh, around the control and obviously frequent weighing. So we'll tell families to get rid of scales from the, from the house. It's the first thing we do, even if their anxious response is to want to weigh their child. That is not helpful. Because of the effects of the uh, the loss of weight, young people may report uh, feeling extremely hot or cold because they can't regulate their, their internal state. Uh, and particularly if they're dehydrated, they might report episodes of fainting or appear by their parents to be struggling to get up their stairs. They seem dizziness, to have dizziness, they may in fact uh, pass out. Of course, the adolescent girl might not have told her parents that her periods have stopped. So that's something we need to ask about in clinic and be, and be sensitive about. I didn't mention in the long term effects, uh, the fact that the amenorrhea can become permanent and uh, in severe cases, even once weight is restored, a young person might essentially lose their fertility. Calluses on the knuckles of the hand is one of the few um, signs in psychiatry that we look for that calluses here on the back of the hands is called Russell's sign and that's sometimes what comes from uh, repeatedly inducing vomiting and that's where the teeth are making marks on the back of the hand. Russell's sign. Irritability and anger, well that can be part of being an adolescent can't it, but if it's around food it's it's significant. So adolescents often restrict their eating, this is kind of a normal phase as I've said, one in five teenage girls uh, in, in the UK are said to be dieting or will self-report themselves to be dieting and uh, two thirds of teenage girls and a third of boys will say they've attempted to lose weight at one point or another. So there is a fundamental belief that skinniness equals happiness and that can be problematic. How do adolescents eat? Well lots because they um, they sleep in, their natural body, body clock is slightly shifted from yours and mine. Uh, and they will skip breakfast. Although I wonder how many of you tuned in to this talk at uh, one minute to nine, having rolled out of bread and better not eaten anything, and you probably won't eat till midday because that's typical for you anyway. 
So we will take an eating history and often find, oh, well, I go to school and I never, I might have half a piece of toast, but I don't eat normally. Mm -hmm. We have to turn that around quickly with families to make sure they start doing things differently. Is management different of young people compared to adults with eating disorders? Yes, absolutely, because compared to an adult, you or I, whose height is now fixed, uh, and if we're doing any change in our in our weight, it's because we're putting it on or, or losing it. We're expecting adolescents because they're in a growth phase to be both going upwards with their height and therefore to be gaining weight. So it is normal to gain weight in children and young people. Uh, the management is also different because we see them as part of a system within their within their family. So whereas in the adult eating disorder sector, we will have uh, adults mostly managed with individual therapies, talking therapies for eating. In CAMS, we absolutely uh, treat them within their family system and we, we rely on the parents for that. We also rely on education. So we've got young people at the minute returning to school uh, who are still quite unwell with anorexia and we rely on teachers to be able to pick up the baton and monitor their intake, uh, including sitting with them at mealtimes. So that happens. And there's also a lot to think about that's outside the scope of this talk about what it is to be an adolescent with peer influence at the minute. There are guidelines from the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health called the Marzipan Guidelines, uh, the management of restricted, restricted eating in paediatric anorexia nervosa, something along those lines. And uh, if you're interested, have a look at that. Those basically give the red flag signs for when weight loss is particularly concerning and when admission to hospital might be required. But actually before that, there's a massive role for the GP. Lots of you will go on to be GPs. Uh, an average GP has 200 patients at any one time on their list, and at least one or two, two will meet criteria for anorexia nervosa. And, uh, and several others will probably have anorexia, but not be known to have it. So it's a really important part of all of our job as doctors to be screening for eating disorders with, frankly, every patient we see who might look underweight. Uh, and rather than just referring them to secondary care for tests for their bowel complaint, we need to ask, well, actually, what are their risk factors for an eating disorder? So a structured history we might take either as a GP or uh, in, as a child psychiatrist or paediatrician is what is the typical daily diet? Talk me through what you eat in a day. Do you have three meals a day uh, and, uh, and three snacks? Um, have there been any changes uh, or exclusions in, in the in the diet? Uh, what is the degree of exercise and vomiting and so on? The stuff we've talked about already, but having a structured approach to this is really important. So maybe take a screen grab of this when you look back on the talk, just to have it to hand when you're in clinic. There are medical conditions not to be missed here, uh, and things like celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease, uh, thyroid problems which can cause weight loss in their own right. Diabetes is commonly uh, the first the first symptom uh, as well as polyuria uh, polydipsia and tiredness is is weight loss so that needs to be thought about and of course malignancies are are unusual in young people but uh, are very much something to be ruled out the physical examination is is essential because there's high levels of physical complications which we've talked about um, and i won't go into detail about this but uh, clearly, we need to know cardiovascular parameters, including uh, ECG, pulse, blood pressure, looking for a postural drop. Uh, that is a loss of 20 milligrams or more of mercury in the systolic reading and also a reflex tachycardia, which is when the young person stands up and their pulse shoots up, which is an evidence that they have a low circulating volume and also low physical reserve. But normal physical examination also does not rule out an eating disorder talked about the callus on the dorsum of the dominant hand but also uh, looking at teeth is very important because someone repeatedly vomiting may lose the animal from their teeth and a sign as well in bulimia nervosa is a sort of broadened jaw if you look at someone you think oh gosh they've got quite a sort of wide jaw it might be that their uh, salivary glands are enlarged from recurrent vomiting um, and uh, I, I won't go to, to cardio making I think so uh, weighing, it's important that young person is weighed consistently on the same scales because so many scales are have aberrant readings to them, really. Uh, so we bring young people back to the same clinic and weigh them in the same way each time, just in their underwear at the same time of day. And we make sure they've passed urine just beforehand so that they haven't 
got a huge amount of water loading and a bladder that's full of a litre and a half of urine, which will give uh, a, a misreading. Uh, and they are supervised when they're being weighed. We're now going to come on to growth charts. So I'm going to pull out of this slightly. I hope you're all still there. Um, let me see if there's any uh, comments popping up. No, you're either all listening attentively um, or you're just sitting there. I hope you find it interesting. So we're going to look at this slide. I'm going to ask you to um, put in the chat box uh, what you see on this uh, slide here. Put into words what you see there. So I tell you what I'm hoping you're looking at as I zoom in here is that this is uh, a growth chart. Oops, thanks. This is a growth chart or for a girl because it's pink. I think someday they'll have to change this, won't they? Because it's a bit outdated. Uh, of a girl who is 16 and a half years old because you can come down. This is age along the top and this is height down the side. So what this tells us is a 16 year old half girl who is 165 ish centimeters. And these are the centiles here of her growth. So she's sitting on about the 50th centile. All right. So for a 16 and a half year old girl, this is uh, normal. So we've got several people saying growth chart, median centipede, centipede, love it. Uh, 50th percentile. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so I'm going to move on to the next one. Again, write in words what you are seeing here. Oops. There. What I hope you're seeing and maybe typing as you go, um, is that this is also a girl. This is a weight chart. If you look at the top, this is a girl who's just passed. Uh, uh, well, now she is 16. When she was 15, she was on the 50th centile for weight because she weighed 54 -ish kilograms. But now she's 16 and a bit. We assume this has been plotted today and she has lost so much weight that she's gone from the 50th centile to under the third centile. So she has lost an awful lot of weight here in a very worrying fashion. So acute drop in centiles. Uh, someone dr says drop three centiles. Well, it's more than that, isn't it? It's gone from 50th down to less than the third. But you're absolutely right. That's what I wanted you to see is a drop in the centiles. Next slide is beware. OK. Why beware of this? I'll tell you as we go and then I'm going to check your answers in the uh, chat box. This demonstrates that a girl who was plotted just over age 11, who's been replotted uh, just before she turns 13, uh, is the same weight as she was. And that wouldn't be so worrying if it was if it was me between year one and two. I haven't gained weight. I'd probably be quite pleased with that. But this is a young girl who should have been growing. Look at this exponential, this sinusoidal growth chart. She should be following her centiles that she was on uh, and so putting her weight um, up here. She might have won, wanted to lose a weight, bit of weight. She might have been encouraged to do that. But actually, this is effectively a significant drop because she hasn't gained weight. So yes, people have said height, uh, so someone said height not changing. Uh, well, this is a, a weight plot. We would expect her height to be going up and so her weight to be going up. Should be increasing weight, Emily says. You're absolutely right, and she isn't. So this is worrying. This chart is also a beware chart. If you only had the one plot on this chart, the second one on the right hand side, you'd say, well, this is a 15 year old who is on the 50th centile roughly for her weight, so I'm not too worried. But if I showed you this plot, 
and you found out that a year before she was on the 90th percentile, uh, then OK, she was clearly overweight then, but she's lost an awful lot of weight, hasn't she, in the space of that year? And maybe that's OK. Maybe that's healthy. But actually, how has she lost weight that quickly and where is that heading is the next question. So we need to keep a very close eye on that young person. And they may well have anorexic features. <clears throat> what about this one? Does anyone want to comment on what this slide demonstrates? I'm hoping you can see it well enough. Sorry, I'm probably not going to. Big enough for you. There we are. So what are people saying? Following the third percentile, which may be normal for this person. Same centile gradient, but still very low, low centile, but thriving. Absolutely. Well done, well spotted. So this is this is weight and this is a this is a really underweight person. But actually, the point of centiles is that you have a normal spread, don't you? So those of you who've met me or know me uh, know that I'm very short. Uh, so if we were looking at my height, I plot on about the second centile for height, but that's normal for me. Um, and it might be that, you know, some people are predisposed to be uh, skinnier, aren't they? So this actually might be normal, right? And seeing that one plot on its own on the right hand side might be very concerning, but in the context of what's happened in the years going before, that's OK. And this might be a patient who's got cystic fibrosis, for example, who is likely to be underweight, but actually is doing all right according to that. So well done those who picked up on that. So my next slide says BMI 15 in a young person, are you worried? And what you'd be able to tell me, I hope, is that actually BMIs in young people uh, aren't the full story. They don't tell us enough about what's going on because a BMI in an adult and someone's uh, height is fixed, has more meaning. I'm going to show you that in, in a different way. OK, so this is a BMI chart. This isn't now uh, weight or height. This is a BMI chart. So if you get past something in an OSCE, look at stay calm and look at what is on your axes. OK, this is a body mass index chart for for a young person from between the ages of 10, 12, 14, 16. And what we can see is that this BMI has dropped. If I look at the next slide, I want you to think about what this means, the percentage median of BMI, OK? Think about weight for height. So if we've got a 14 year old in front of us, we want to know how tall she is. Let's say she's 150 centimetres tall. And then we need to know, according to her age and her sex, uh, what is her height and her weight compared to what we would normally expect in the normal distribution. And the percentage median BMI is the fraction of the average BMI, the typical BMI, at that age for that sex. That's quite difficult to get your head around, but a 14 year old girl of X height and X weight has a BMI of 15. Um, then we look at what the 50th centile BMI, is, which is 19.5 at that age, and we calculate her percentage. So 15 is 77% of 19 and a half. So that is worryingly low because she's less than 85% of the median BMI. And this girl may well have anorexia. She's clearly underweight. So we, we, we plot these things and a key message in recovery, a young person will say to us, well, what, a, what weight are you aiming for? You, you know, you, you're not going to stop until I'm 60 kilograms. And we will say, actually, we're not concerned about a specific weight and we're not going to give you a target that's not going to be helpful but we're going to monitor your um, your measurements according to what you should be uh, compared to your peers and that's a that's an easier way of having that conversation although of course in our mind we have a target percentage medium BMI and we want it to be at least above 90 95 basically to suggest that they are weight restored this is another way of demonstrating that so these are z scores along the bottom if you have the normal distribution, so if this was height, I'd be sitting right down, down here. Uh, in the, the median 50th centile BMI 
is there. So if somebody is sitting there, they are 100% of the median BMI and anything less than that is percentage points lower. So the 90% of the median BMI, 20% of the population sit below that. 80% median BMI, only 2% uh, percent of the population will be less than that score. Uh, we have a girl on the paediatric ward in extra at the minute who has the lowest percentage median BMI I've ever come across at 62. Uh, typically we'll be treating girls who will have percentage median somewhere between 70 and 80 percent. There are a lot of risk factors for eating disorders uh, and some of these will just come to you naturally and you'll you'll probably uh, know them already, you might identify with some of them actually yourselves um, because of the nature of medicine. You know, we are perfectionistic people um, and we're also prone to uh, low self-esteem and judgment and we get compared with one another all the time. So you're doing exams constantly and you're getting told where you are compared to the rest of your peers. And I can tell you that's pretty toxic when it's a PE lesson for a group of adolescent girls and a well-meaning PE teacher comes along to explain BMI and says, let's plot all of your BMIs on this chart, girls, and see what we can learn. Uh, what tends to happen when that occurs is that about a month later, we'll have three or four referrals for young people severely restricting their eating. Uh, so the combination of perfectionism um, and competitiveness and encouragement of competition is pretty toxic. Uh, and additionally, if people are doing things like high-end sport where they are uh, being encouraged to lose weight. For example, I had a patient last year who was a very good climber and she was told by her climbing instructor actually if she lost a few kilograms she would probably be even better. That was not helpful for her clearly. So a lot of psychological triggers and there's a lot of social triggers as well. So really common we'll see young people in clinic who have had uh, adverse childhood experiences. Uh, quite likely they've been bullied at school uh, and maybe they're in highly pressured environments and there are some schools which produce more referrals to us than others because they might be encouraging an extraordinarily high level of, of, of competition and expectation. People talk about the contagious nature of anorexic cognitions and behaviours. Uh, certainly the behaviours, yes, less so the cognitions, but we do see clusters of young people presenting and we do see young people who we admit to the ward who, who we know uh, are friends with the last patient we had and so on. So a few more minutes, I'm going to talk about the fundamental assumptions of how we how we treat young people and adults. The first is we have an agnostic view of the cause of illness. That is to say, it's not helpful to sit and try and pick apart why this illness has come about. The treatment is the thing that we focus on and we tell parents that they're not to blame what has happened. They tend to feel blamed regardless. But no blame doesn't mean no anxiety. So sometimes we raise the anxiety in the parents if they seem sort of not too worried or disinterested. And that's when I show those slides. You can hear my children in the background there. Helpful. So we don't dig around for cause of, uh, of illness too much. We have a non-authoritarian therapeutic stance. And that, is, that means to say, I don't sit there as the child's psychiatrist and say, you must eat now. Uh, and you know, demand and expect things from young people because that is unhelpful. We get alongside them, we understand their distress with what's going on and we're there to help and assist, not instruct. So we join the family as, as problem solvers and we focus on their strengths and their, not their weaknesses and also what they want to get back to doing. So commonly this is a young person who would have had to have stopped doing their trampolining and their netball and will say, look, help us to get you uh, physically well enough through eating so that you can return to the things that you've enjoyed doing. Parents are actually responsible for weight restoration. So sometimes we come across parents who say, well, this is not normal. You can't, you know, I'm not going to sit with my child at home and get them to eat. That's what you need to do because they're unwell. They need to be in hospital. And actually we need to persuade them that's not the case. Uh, it's a parental function to get a young person to eat. And they do need to, for example, take time off work and to sit with their child uh, to encourage them and support them through eating when it's difficult. So we empower parents to do that. And yes, they might have plates smashed and uh, they might have the child they're looking after screaming at them and saying that they hate them. But actually, again, that's part of sort of what you sign up to with being a parent. And we externalise the illness and that's what 
But what I mean by that is that we'll encourage the young person, the family to see anorexia as something separate that has almost come into their child like a cancer would or whatever. So they can be angry at the illness and not at the child and the behaviours. So we use the disease model of, of the analogy of, of cancer or sometimes possession model. Gosh, this anorexia is like something that's really taken over you. Um, and uh, how are we going to push push back? The Venn diagram I refer to there is a bit like saying, uh, here, here is your child, here is anorexia, and it's come along and it is obscuring your child because it's blocking the normal conversations you have. Uh, you seem to have the relationship seems to have deteriorated with them. But actually, this is the anorexia that's come in the way of things. And intellectually, we can talk about pushing back that Venn diagram and preventing the eclipse happening. We don't negotiate with eating disorders. We will medically stabilise and we'll talk about food as medicine. Food is the treatment for anorexia nervosa. And then we'll psychiatrically stabilise. So we need to consider, are they, is this young person at risk uh, of, of self-harm or suicide? What do we need to do in the immediate uh, future to manage their mental state? And restoring weight and decreasing dangerous behaviours um, is part of that. And all of this is about focusing on getting the adolescent development back on track because it is derailed through this sort of illness. Sometimes young people will lose a year at school. Uh, we might encourage them to reset a year in order to not impact on their GCSEs. This is very topical because COVID is obviously putting lots of adolescents off track at the minute. Family-based therapy is the treatment of choice for children and young people. So I work very closely with family therapists and I do some family therapy myself in assisting young people to recover. I think I'm going to pause there because I, I've given you an awful lot of information and I just want to check back on the on the chat to see if there's anything arising there. Uh, I'm aware I I talk a lot and uh, and there's tons to think about there. So let's see if there's anything else. Uh, so uh, Emily says, do you just focus on weight restoring for treatment? Uh, no. Do we see the psychological problems getting better on their own when they're weight restored? Yeah, that's a really good question. So lots of young people present apparently really quite depressed and anxious with their eating disorder. And if we focus on getting enough nutrition into their brain so that cognitively they can uh, improve and recover, we'll see their uh, their mental state improve. So food will help lift mood. Uh, of course, the adolescent might not believe that, but they tend to see it once they once they are restored with their weight. So the young person we have, for example, in hospital at the minute, she's been admitted for three weeks for a refeeding program. And uh, she came in really quite low, but even after a week of managing to eat with the nursing staff, we can see that she's brightened. And I I can't remember which students are with me on Friday, but assuming my COVID result is negative, we're going to go and see that young person on the paediatric ward. So you'll get to experience some of that. Uh, Philida says, do you think that the government plan recently announced that school aged children should be weighed? Oh, yeah, at school, at least annually, we have an adverse effect in the context of eating disorders. That's a really good question. I am concerned about a focus on that. Uh, and I'm also concerned about the government drive to put calorific intake, uh, calorific content on every piece of food, on every bit of menu, because it only potentially increases the young person's uh, focus on that. That being said, we have an obesity problem, uh, which was on the radio just this morning about how the government's going to address that. And what the evidence shows is that the interventions used so far have not been sufficiently effective and obesity continues to uh, increase, which is a public health emergency. So there's a real tension there, isn't there, between um, between interventions, which might be well-meaning, and uh, and the risks. Becky asks, when is a SUS test appropriate? Good. Uh, so the SUS test is something that the paediatricians would normally do as part of the physical examination, which uh, gets the young person to lie flat on the bed and asks them to sit up. So can they sit up without without struggling and using their arms to sort of to sort of crawl up. So you'd expect somebody to be able to sit up from flat and squat and then stand. So in the clinical room, ask them to squat right down to the floor and then push themselves back up again, again, without supporting their hands. If they can't do those things, then they have a positive SUS test, which means that their, their muscles are, are too weak to be sustaining them. Uh, is it appropriate across all ages? Um, yeah, I mean, we certainly do it with the with adolescents. Uh, 
What are the most unhelpful or helpful things that friends and family can say and do for someone with an eating disorder? I think the most unhelpful thing is to talk about the eating disorder as if it is the person's fault or their or their choice. Family saying things like, we can't believe you're doing this to us, you're tearing our family apart. Why don't you just eat? This is simple. Uh, so people not being thoughtful. But, you know, this is a complex topic and parents can't be expected to understand the nature of what we've talked about here for an hour without a lot of psychoeducation. What can also be unhelpful from a friend's point of view is when a young person's lost a lot of weight and then their friends say, you look great. Oh, wow. You know, this is this is brilliant. You've lost all this weight. Uh, so the sort of the gaminess of encouraging people to uh, to lose weight alongside of another. Julia asks, from your experience, what impact does the admission to Peace Ward have on young people with eating disorders? Do you say it's the right place for them? I appreciate that sometimes it's needed for physical problems. So in Exeter and actually across Devon, we do plan three week refeed admissions. They are highly effective. They change the environment so the parents get a break. Uh, there are consequences to not eating such that if a young person will sign up to come in, uh, they don't come in detained under the Mental Health Act usually, and they will understand that if they fail to eat the food put in front of them as supported with nursing staff, they will then have to have a supplement drink. If they fail to have a supplement drink, they will have an NG tube inserted and it very rarely gets to that point. There's something about the structure and the regulation of the paediatric department that removes that sense of control from the young person that allows them to allow themselves to eat and uh, sort of knocks the anorexia on the head. So we have really good outcomes from young people admitted to that and it is the right place for them. The caveat to that is if we bring a young person in for that sort of admission and they are just too unwell, they're too resistant to it, we're getting it to the point of thinking about restraining a young person to pass NG tubes, then we will look for specialist psychiatric units uh, but I've been working in Exeter for th three years and we've probably only done that nine or ten times, whereas in an average uh, week we will have one or two young people on the paediatric ward having this sort of refeed admission. Our young people with eating disorder mostly body image or sport performance orientated would get something that some that simply dislike food. Um, so it's not exclusive that young people with eating disorders will be very conscious about sport and actually some of them uh, have no interest in the sport whatsoever. Some that simply dislike food. So that's more likely to be one of those sort of ARFID presentations or an EDNOS eating disorder not otherwise specified. But perhaps lots of people with an eating disorder, their anorexia will say to the clinician, well, I just don't like this, I'm not eating this. Are those good outcomes long term? Uh, yes, so if we find that somebody has fully recovered, uh, obviously there is a chance of relapse uh, that is higher and a greater chance of relapse if there are still uh, some concerns around food. Is relapse common? Uh, I've looked after a number of young people who we've treated for their eating disorder, who've done pretty well. And then a year or so down the low line, life stresses have uh, combined to to mean that they do slip backwards. But usually we can pick up on the treatment, slide back into where we were and just go at it really hard and, and get them well again. Uh, OK, I think we have to finish there. I'm really pleased you've asked lots of questions. Thank you ever so much. Um, I don't know if we are now able to stop the recording. Heidi, I think we should probably stop there. Uh, and everyone yeah, can watch yeah, this back yeah, another yeah. time. Thank you. And can start the recording. Lovely. Uh